Tyrannosaurus. Design Tyrannosaurus has undergone the least most changes over the last few decades. By that, I mean the bones and their reconstruction have not changed much, but the outside details of the animal have quite a bit, but only in smaller details that someone unfamiliar with the literature may not even notice. Here, all of those details are laid bare for all to notice, or not, hence my confusion as to why it was never touched on, especially considering how famous the animal is. The most famous incarnation of the Tyrannosaurus is everyone's favorite Rexy of Jurassic Park. This is how most paleontologists and paleoartists of the 1980s through to the early 2000s reconstructed Tyrannosaurus. The T-Rex that appears here in prehistoric planet has more muscle, fat, and tissues. This is based on about 20 years of research on the bones of Tyrannosaurus and comparisons and inferences made using modern animals and increasingly well-preserved specimens of close T-Rex relatives. So, specifically, we see that the torso of this Tyrannosaurus is much deeper and wider than the Jurassic Park animal. All non-avian dinosaurs, like their crocodilian cousins, had a set of ribs which rested within their belly. They are commonly called belly ribs, or anatomically referred to as gastralia. These helped protect the belly and played a part in breathing. As more Tyrannosaur specimens have been found, from the 90s to now, it has been found that Tyrannosaurus had an extremely deep chest, trunk, and pelvis. A full set of gastralia would have started here at the extremely deep and wide pubic boot and would have continued here until the shoulder girdle here. On top of this, Tyrannosaurus easily had one of the widest, most barrel-shaped torsos of any terrestrial predator to ever live. I mean, look at this chunker. They are literally big-boned. On top of being big-boned, they had the bony scaffolding that strongly suggests, and correlates to, enormous leg muscles. This part of the pelvis, the ilium, was huge and scooped. Here would have been where those enormous thigh muscles attached and pushed and pulled along the bulging calf muscles. The face of this Tyrannosaurus is probably the most obviously updated of the whole thing. You have keratinous hornlets on this part of the eye socket and this part. They sort of grow into one another to form a more prominent brow ridge. Not quite as copyrightably exaggerated as the Jurassic Park design, but still quite prominent. I would not be surprised if the real animal may have had even larger or pointier crests here. Another chunk of keratin is here on the ridge along the snout. I find it kind of a weird design choice to keep them conservatively colored. It has been a somewhat speculative hypothesis over the years that the keratinous nose ridge and hornlets of not just Tyrannosaurus or the other Tyrannosauroids, but of most theropods, may have been brightly colored in a similar way to the keratin which adorns the faces of many species of birds today. In this way, they may have had many visual functions, individual identification, species recognition, mate selection, and more. Some research, some of which included Dr. Darren Nash, found that sexual selection was the most parsimonious explanation and primary driving force behind the exaggerated facial crests of these animals, as well as the crests and horns of other dinosaurs like the Ceratopsians, Ornithopods, Thyreophorans, and more. A more recent study by soon-to-be Dr. Sarah Davis and Dr. Julia Clark found that a more likely part of the body to be brightly colored may have been the face and feet. They studied the presence of keratinoids in the skin of a bunch of living and extinct reptiles – birds, dinos, turtles, crocs, and more. Keratinoids are the pigments responsible for expression of bright yellows, reds, and oranges. Heavily simplifying, they concluded that there is about a 50% chance that keratinoid expression in skin and non-feather keratin was present in the most recent common ancestor of the archosaurs, the group including dinosaurs, birds, pterosaurs, crocs, and more. Feathers would not have been the best bet for bright colors. Instead, the skin on the legs and feet, the chest and neck, and the face are better supported by the data though it was also found that the theropod dinosaurs that deviated from a strict carnivorous diet may have had a higher probability for these brightly colored feet, necks, and faces. As such, the lack of color on the face or crests of prehistoric planets Tyrannosaurus falls under a sort of gray wiggle room.
I personally would have liked to see these areas more colorful, but it is not inaccurate to keep them conservatively grey. Aside from the crests, you see the critter has a set of lips. This has been a semi-contentious issue in the last few years. The only reason for this is due to a few experts concluding a lower probability of the presence of lip-like tissues on the face. The vast majority of the scientific community agrees that lip-like tissues are more likely because nearly every single terrestrial animal has some sort of covering on their face to conceal their teeth. The major exceptions are those that evolved ways around teeth. If you have a beak, you probably don't have teeth too. The biggest stick in the craw of the lip v no lip discussion is that the only living cousins and descendants of the non-avian dinosaurs evolved away from the condition of most non-avian dinosaurs to such a degree that they no longer offer a good comparison or control group. All birds have no teeth, a beak, and no lips. All crocodilians have no lips. We can throw birds out of the discussion altogether because of the beaks. Crocs should also be thrown out due to how distantly related they are to the dinosaurs and for their highly derived body plan and habit. In fact, the only known group of dinosaurs to be anything like Crocs were the Spinosaurs and even here they only share the most superficial of characteristics. A handful of researchers have directly compared the holes which poke through the face bones of most non-avian theropod dinosaurs to those of the crocodilians. They do share some similarities, but I'm not sure the comparison is that apt considering how distant crocs and theropods are phylogenetically and how different their ecology was. Instead, many researchers favor the dino face holes as passageways through which blood vessels were routed to provide sensitivity to the snout and blood to lip-like tissues. Many have balked at the inclusion of lips on theropod dinosaur reconstructions as they conflate these lip-like tissues with the lips of lizards or mammals. However, though they may have shared some mechanical similarities, the lips of the theropod dinosaurs would not have been the exact same type of structure. They were not like mammal lips and would not have allowed the theropod to snarl. They were probably more like the lips of lizards being immobile and simply to seal moisture within the mouth. Even here, I would caution away from direct comparison to lizards as the lips of theropod dinosaurs could not have been the exact same type of tissue either. Prehistoric Planet's Tyrannosaurus walks the line quite nicely. They even gave it vertically aligned rows of feature scales along the snout, mirroring the holes within the bones. Tyrannosaurus eyeballs would have looked quite small compared to the vast heft of the animal. Despite these proportions, the eyeball was absolutely massive in gross overall size. They were about 8 centimeters in diameter, about 4 inches. That's roughly orange size depending on what kind of orange you are familiar with. This is bigger than most terrestrial animals alive today and would have gifted the animal with incredible sight. Here, the prehistoric planet people have given the animal rounded bird-like pupils. Unsurprisingly, the pupil shape of the extinct dinosaurs is pretty much a complete unknown. There is a clear relationship between ecological niche and the shape of the pupil in most animals alive today which would certainly have been true for the animals of the past. Herbivorous animals are more likely to have horizontal pupils than are predatory animals. Diurnal animals are more likely to have circular pupils than vice versa, and so on. This may be why, here, that the prehistoric planet team gave the Tyrannosaurus rounded bird-like pupils, inferring that they think it may have been a diurnal predator. Though there may be some evidence of its day versus night habits within its brain case, I don't think a study of this kind has yet to be conducted. Interestingly enough, Jurassic Park did the same with their Tyrannosaurus. In some shots, you can see a thin covering of hair-like feathers on the back of the head, neck, and some of the rest of the top of the body. Whether or not Tyrannosaurus had feathers has been another oft-discussed idea. Biggest problem is the lack of direct evidence. No Tyrannosaurus specimen has ever been found with skin or feather impressions. Uh, the exception to this was a tiny patch of scale impressions on one specimen. There are rumors that more impressions were preserved in this specimen but are yet to be described, and other rumors suggest bigger sections of skin may have been found on other specimens, but they remain rumors. 
The tiny chunk of skin that has been found reflects only scales, but the way it was preserved would not have preserved feathers if they were present. It also comes from a part of the body that probably wouldn't have been feathered if the animal even had feathers. Well, that's just great. Phylogenetically, or who and what it is related to, suggests that Tyrannosaurus would have been a good candidate among dinosaurs for a coat of feathers. It was a Tyrannoraptoran, cousin to the Maniraptor group. Maniraptorans include the vast majority of direct fossil evidence of feathers. Dromaeosaurs, birds, alvarosaurs, therizinosaurs, scansoriopterygids, troodontids, and oviraptorosaurs. That pretty much means feathers were ancestral to the Tyrannoraptor group. On top of that, a large Tyrannosauroid, Eutyrannus, had feather impressions preserved with the skeleton. This opens up an evolutionary reason to suspect Tyrannosaurus may have had feathers. Then comes the thermal properties. Feathers can function to keep an animal warm, similar to but not exactly like the hair or fur of mammals. Unlike mammals, feathers can also function to cool down an animal or to just keep a constant body temperature regardless of the environment. Birds of the tropics and deserts have feathers. Uh, then again, these are small animals and many theropod dinosaurs were as large as or bigger than the largest modern mammals. Some researchers suggest there is a size threshold where feathers become detrimental to the organism. Other researchers suggest this may not work with organisms as distinct as the non-avian theropod dinosaurs. Here, the prehistoric planet crew give the adult Tyrannosaurus only a sparse elephant-like covering. This episode also introduces us to a set of Tyrannosaurus younglings. Unlike the adult, these guys have a much heavier coat of fluffier feathers. This has been hypothesized for quite some time that it was the young of large feather possible non-avian theropod dinosaurs that carried a coat of feathers. Besides that, the design of the T-Rex younglings match what is known of Tyrannosaurus and Tyrannosaur young to a T. They were more lightly built with longer legs, less muscle and fat, and longer, skinnier snoots. The main character here is the old male Tyrannosaurus, who is stated to be about 30 years old with the battle scars to prove it. He is recently scarred up from his battle with the Triceratops we see him eating in the beginning of his segment. Even though I am sure a lot of us would have wanted to see the battle that led to this scene, the point of this extra Tyrannosaurus segment is to show the more sensual activities they may have been up to. The old male makes his way to a river edge for a bath. We see him scoop drinking, or gravity assisted drinking, which is common among many birds and reptiles today and that was shown with Tarbosaurus in the last episode. He is confronted by a smaller, young female. The male rocks back on his tail and haunches and rears up to reveal his orange colored throat before warbling and reverberating a semi infrasound call to the female. She reciprocates and the two acknowledge their bond by nuzzling, with Attenborough noting that Tyrannosaurs had super sensitive snoots. Evidence from Tyrannosaur facial bones shows that they had high nervous sensitivity across the jaws and face, and that ritualized facial contact involving rubbing, nuzzling, and biting was something they probably did. A courtship pair highly likely engaged in facial contact, as shown. How did the prehistoric planet team determine the courtship postures and vocalizations that might exist in T-Rex? They looked at postures and calls made by living archosaurs that bracket T-Rex and found commonalities. Appeasement slash conciliation in living archosaurs involves head lifting, throat display, and while aggressive broadcast bellows can be issued with an open mouth, contact calls and advertisement calls are often closed mouth sounds that emanate widely from chests and necks. After the courtship displays, we cut to them in the process of mating tastefully, prudishly, and strategically obscured by some foliage in the foreground. Everything about the mating sequence was informed by phylogenetic bracketing. Believe it or not, lots of work has been done on the mating postures and habits of non-bird dinosaurs, much of it informed by work on birds and crocs. This explains why the mating Tyrannosauruses are low to the ground, 
as opposed to the famous Spanish display of two Tyrannosaurus skeletons getting it on, with the male standing way too erect, which was probably not physically possible. For more interesting stories about nature, the history of life, or what goes bump in the night, subscribe, like this video, drop a comment in the comment section below, and hit the bell icon to stay in the know with everything Edge. Thanks for watching.